super hard, it will cut through things. But you wouldn't make a diamond hammer. Uh, for those who are Minecraft players, uh, a diamond sword, the very moment you swung and hit something, it would shatter. That is the truth behind it. You, but the iron sword would work better. So let's talk about the four defining properties of uh, metals. is electrical conductivity, is thermal conductivity, uh, is formability, and um, reflectability. So electrical conductivity, as we, like we were talking about, is the ability to conduct electricity. This is when you're starting to look at stuff like tungsten, gold, um, silver and copper. Those are the ones that are really good for it. Uh, but why don't we use gold, silver, and copper like rods to weld with? Well, that's because tungsten can handle the thermal part of it better. That's why uh, tungsten can be so much hotter at such a smaller thing and just weld steels and other stuff like that better. Um, so why don't we make tungsten into our electrical components like a computer? That's because it doesn't like to change shape. It doesn't have any formability or it doesn't want to deform. If you take a piece of tungsten and you smack it hard enough, you'll cut it in half. It'll just shatter. But gold, you can take it and bend it out. You can you know, mash it and unform it with your hands. Same thing with copper and silver in their pure state. So that's one of the things is that, yeah, they have the electrical conductivity, but they also have the formability to make wires and bend and stuff. Whereas tungsten is like really conductive, but it can handle heat, but it's not really bendable. Another way to kind of think about it is a piece of steel compared to rebar. If you've ever heard of rebar, you can't really bend rebar. You need to heat up rebar first and stuff like that or it could just snap. And the last one is a reflect, uh, is reflectivity. You know, how shiny it is and your ability to reflect light. Um, typically when you start thinking about stuff that's reflective, you know, aluminum. Uh, a lot of your mirrors now are made with aluminum in it, it's just polished aluminum and it's super shiny. Um, liquid mercury, which has an extreme shine to it, is also very reflective. Now, this is something I've talked to you a couple of times. This is why I've told students, hey, don't dip your metal into a uh, bath of water to cool it down when it's like red hot. You know, when it's still stupid hot or something like that and you quench it, I've told you, it messes it up. It'll make you fail a bend test. Well, why is that? Because we have crystal structures in metal. Stuff that's at how it's combined and held together. You know, metal atoms are, connect, are connected together in a stable, positive lineup in a regular, orderly alignment. You know, this is kind of what they're trying to show you. Now, when we say regular, there will be where you might have a crystal, a crystal structure going this way, and then one's going this way, and then one's going this way, and they kind of overlap each other and lock up and hold each other. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they are not regular. These are long chains. Um, and this long regular array is called a space lattice because it takes up that area. Uh, the unit cell is almost, it's the smallest volume that encloses complete atomic structure. Um, and when it comes to these crystal structures, there are three common unit cells found in metals. The first one is the body central cube, or the BCC. Uh, room temperature iron has a BBC, or a BCC unit cell. So if you notice, we have four, you know, you make up your little cube with one in the center. So it's a cubic shape with one atom at each center and one atom at each exact center of the cube. So you got it, each corner, one in the center. And obviously the lines don't truly exist, but that you kind of remember that in your head, you know. Metals can be hit and, and will dent rather than break. 
know, how many times have you hit your piece of steel with like a hammer or a chipping hammer or something? And it deforms. It will absolutely deform, but it doesn't just shatter. Um, the dent occurs on the atoms slide past one each other, so they actually move away from each other. And the sliding occurs most easily in a certain direction in the cell. But then we get to face centered qubit, or SCC. This is a unit, uh, you know, a unit cell for room temperature aluminum. This is typically the door for there, you know, is in a cubic shape with one atom in each corner and one atom at the center of each face of the cube. So you have your ones on each edge, each corner, and then, so for this face, there's one right there, for this side right here, there's one at the top, at the bottom, right, and then in the back, there's one. So that's the difference between BCC and SCC. Uh, FCC structures have more direction for atoms to slide past one another than PCC. Uh, metals with FCC atomic structures are more uh, formal than those with other crystal structures. Remember, that's aluminum. Aluminum can bend and move and stuff like that a lot easier than steel. And then we get to your hexagonal closed pack, F or uh, HCP. Uh, solid magnesium has this type of structure. And these uh, type of cells um, contain a three layers of hexagonal planes of atoms. So they're hexagonal, and then you have these right here. You can see the three of them actually touching. Metals with the HCP structure are less formable than others with BCC or SCC. So these don't want to move very much. Deformation. Metal uh, atoms are typically 0.28 nanometers apart. So just, you know, even though they're made up of stuff like that, they still split up. Other atoms must slide past a million other atoms, so 10 to the 6 power atoms, before it moves one quarter millimeter. You see what I'm saying? It, this is ridiculous. You know, one atom must slide past a million other atoms before it moves one quarter of a million. Metal parts are not single crystals, so that's not what we're saying. We're not saying it's made up of one giant crystal. It's not like when you think of a diamond that's a crystal, it's just a big one thing. No, it is made of small individual crystals that are all over that. If you've ever seen well, a good way to think of it, if you've ever done a bend test and it breaks, you see all the jagged edges. Those are spots probably in between the crystal structures that snap apart. And it is made of, you know, millions of these crystal structures. This is when we get into the grain boundaries. Grain boundaries are a different orientation when, where they meet. Um, if you go to page 57 in your book, you see the different squares and how they, you know, they lined up and you had your different lattices and stuff like that, but because they started in different areas and then they expanded out, sometimes they come off and they hit like that and that's just how it works out. Uh, if X was acid, you know, grain boundaries uh, react faster, revealing that boundary. That's why when you typically see uh, those who've done folded steel, especially like Damascus steel, if you've ever seen it on like Forge with Fire, or you've watched like TikTok videos or YouTube videos of people making uh, the layered steels and then they etch them, you see the different layers. And that's what we're trying to get into. You know, the atoms slide slightly differently within grains and along grain boundaries. Um, this changes the certain, you know, the smoothness of a surface. So these are very uh, important. Um, so you see it, you know, I was talking about right here where you had the different grains and the lattices, and you see you have these little voids in between them. And those little voids will 
change up how things happen. You know, slip in metal in a single crystal, planes of atoms slide past another planes of atoms along slip planes. This is slip planes. Um, atoms at the grain boundaries are not clearly aligned with either crystal. Allow for easier to deformation by sliding atoms along slip planes and grain boundaries and stuff like that. Now remember, you're seeing the cubic one, but some of them don't slip very well. They don't want to deform easily. Some of them just crack. Uh, then you have your chemical reactions to certain things like that. Uh, some reactions occur naturally in metal. Some reactions are purposely used to obtain certain properties. The uh, chemical reduction of a metal or changes it into a metal. Um, metal oxides are reduced to metals. You know, you can get iron oxide to iron. Other examples or other elements or compounds um, oxides at the same time. For example, the reduction of iron oxide, like I just said, to make iron metal. And then Carbon is oxidized to make carbon monoxide. Um, and when you're going further on, you know, you're talking about, well, you have iron, you have carbon, you mix them together, what do you get? You get steel or cast iron, depending on the amount of carbon. Uh, compounds found in bulk metal. Um, oxygen diffused into titanium metal to form titanium oxide inside of titanium. Um, these particles degrade properties, and when welding titanium, protective gas is used to prevent this. And we know this. For those who've welded either MIG, uh, TIG, or flux core gas shielded, if you don't have your gas on, it allows oxygen to get in, and that's when you start getting stuff like porosity. That's when you start getting um, this weird film or something like that on top of your weld. And that's because you're allowing oxygen to get in there and it becomes an oxide. Uh, and it just completely changes the properties of the metal and makes it less desirable. Uh, sulfur and iron reacts to form iron sulfate. Uh, this can melt and cause steel to be uh, hot, sharp, or to be hot, short, well, not hot, short at high temperatures. It tears along grain boundaries during forming processes, steel is pro, uh, proceeded to keep levels of sulfur very low. So that's one that we don't want in there. We don't want sulfur to go in there because it can change the properties of, sulfur, of the steel and make it worse. It can make it easier to deform or break. Then you have mixture solutions and phrases. A mixture is a combination of two or more substances that are remain unchanged individually can be easily separated again. Um, and then you have a solution. You know, the combination of two or more substances through which one or more substances completely dissolves into another. And then you have a phase. Any region of a material with properties that are consistent of changing slowly and have one particular crystal structure. Um, Let's look at an example of a mixture. Um, I said salt water or something like that, but you could also think of a mixture of like sugar water. You can put sugar and water, mix it up, or stuff like that, and then after a while, you know, if you let the water evaporate, the sugar will be left alive and make sugar crystals. Same thing with salt. Let's say mixture. You know. They will combine for a little bit, but eventually they'll separate again. You can uh, mud is a mixture. If you let it sit, you know, long enough, the dirt will fall to the bottom. Uh, all the sediment will fall, and the water will float to the top. But let's look at a solution. Steel is a solution. It is actually a compound of like iron, carbon, and other stuff, and that's a solution. It is something that is not easily separated again. So they become one thing, essentially. So remember, a mixer is you mix it up, it's there for a while, but if you let it sit long enough, they'll separate back apart. A solution, they are combined, and it takes more work to pull them back apart. So 
Always kind of remember that when you're going through things. I see we were just talking about this mixtures and solutions. Sugar water. A mixture of the two or more phases. Uh, sugar added to a cup of tap water without stirring. You know, the sugar typically falls to the bottom. Some will melt into the water. Um, and then when heated or stirred or stuff like that, you know, the sugar will become not visible and then mix it to the water. Um, but for metals, which is more, you know, your solutions, metals at a high temperature make for the solution and mixture. So they'll actually have your different changes. That's why it's very important that you let it cool down in a certain way. Most alloys contain multiple phases at room temperature. You can see phases and solid things, you know, simply cut, polish, and etch. But we'll show that more as we get further in. But I hope that explained more when it came to chapter four, that we went more into it and that you could see, and I hope it explained it more in detail that, that you needed. Um, when we get to chapter five, we'll start talking more and more about how all this matters, how this all affects, and stuff like that. So I hope you have a good day, and I will talk to you next time.